So, and, it, and it's great to hear of both Chancellor Cantor and the mayor sort of riff on our title um, this year. Uh, the title is actually drawn from the opening line of Maya Angelou's Singin', Swingin', and Gettin' Merry Like Christmas, the third in her multi-volume autobiography. And there she wrote, music was my refuge. I could crawl into the space between the notes and curl my back to loneliness. But you know that what Angelou describes in that opening line is no simple retreat. This is the volume, in fact, in which she recounts her early years as a performer at the Purple Onion in San Francisco, touring Europe with a company of Porgy and Bess, and in which she changes her name and becomes Maya Angelou. And music is the plot's engine, the vehicle by which she takes on the host of new social experiences in a record shop on Fillmore Ave where she worked, in a restaurant in Verona, Italy, that help her define or redefine who she is, who she wants to be, and how she will live her life amidst both the mid-century racial and gender antagonism she experienced and the new opportunity she encountered. The space between the notes was both personal and political. There, she curled her back to loneliness and discovered new worlds of resistance and self-making. This year's Marion Thompson Wright lecturer is many things. A vibraphonist named the best mallet player at least eight times by the Jazz Journalists Association, one of the most important young artists in jazz, according to the LA Times, and soon according to everybody in this room, <laughs> uh, and a four-time Grammy nominee. He's a collaborator and composer and band leader who you can hear on a dizzying array of albums. Um, his 11th as leader, entitled Sonic Creed and made with his band Blackout, will be released in September. He's a teacher across many venues and media, including at the Manhattan School of Music, where he's associate dean and director of jazz arts, at NJ Pack, where he is the artistic director for jazz education, and via, this was new to me, um, an ear training app he created called Harmony Cloud, which you can download from iTunes. Um, and those are just some of the highlights from an astonishingly accomplished career, all of which would have made him an ideal MTW lecturer. But what really sealed the deal for us is the sort of thing he's going to be doing for us today. And when I told Wayne Winborn what we were thinking about doing this year for MTW, he immediately said, go watch Stefan's TED Talk. And while I'm not going to tell you what he says or does in that talk, I'll tell you what I learned, that like Ms. Angelou, Mr. Harris is a remarkably thoughtful and accessible theorist of music's role in the world, of what we can learn from musicians and their work, and how what we learn from music can be put to use in our troubled world. The title of his talk, though, though it's more than a talk, is Jazz and the Art of Listening. It is a great honor and joy to have him and his band here with us today. So please join me in welcoming this year's Marion Thompson Wright lecturer, Mr. Stefan Harris. All right, all right. Good morning, family and friends. Good morning, family and friends. Good morning. Isn't that amazing saying good morning with piano chords is just sad. <laughs> I need to get me a piano player just to be at the house in the morning. I see my wife in the morning. Good morning, baby. How you doing? As you start to realize, I'm an improviser. So, uh, Thelonious Monk was very famous for not being a man of a lot of words. But he would say things that had a lot of depth in just a single sentence. And one of the things that he said was that talking about music is like dancing about architecture. That's all he said. <laughs> and so we're going to start off by telling our stories, our, sharing our authentic selves and organized sound in the same way that our ancestors did because they were not allowed to publicly speak their truth.
<laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. I had a red folder, but my wife told me the yellow one went better with my blue jacket. <laughs> she also told me I better not embarrass her today. Okay, now I, I know I'm supposed to be here to talk about music and all, but, but did you see Black Panther? <laughs> now this is a true story. I have a dear friend who is an absolutely brilliant composer, arranger, and educator. Let's call him Joe. No, 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 let's call him Ray Ray, that's better. <laughs> a few weeks ago, someone reached out to him about an amazing job opportunity at a major educational institution. They wanted to schedule the interview on Friday, February 16th, yesterday. <laughs> so you already know. Ray Ray told them that he was not available that day and scheduled the interview for some time during the following week. He called me immediately after he scheduled the interview to tell me about this great opportunity. I asked him, why couldn't you do the interview on the 16th? And he said, on February 16th, I will be doing what most black people in America will be doing, <laughs> watching Black Panther. He continued and said, listen, the interview is in another state, so I wouldn't be able to make it back in time to see the movie. I already bought my tickets and my outfit for Black Panther weeks ago, so I'm focused and ready to celebrate. <laughs> now, at first, I thought he was joking, but then it dawned on me that Ray Ray was dead serious and that the debut of this film was a cultural happening that he wasn't willing to miss. What is it about a movie that can galvanize people to come together with such personal conviction? Is it simply the power of entertainment? Or is there a greater sense of purpose coded deep within the lines of dialogue and visual displays? I made sure that my older son Langston saw a Black Panther last night, last night, not simply for entertainment, but rather for a type of spiritual amplification. When Langston saw those images of superheroes who looked and sounded like him, he began to be able to imagine himself as the hero. He had a very similar reaction to seeing Neil deGrasse Tyson a few weeks ago at NJ Pack. Perhaps this is why we all love movies, sports, music, and other forms of entertainment. Is it because we see a part of ourselves reflected in the art that we consume? Our joys, pains, aspirations are on full display in the realm of art. Maybe that's the quintessential role of the artists in our society, to be the griot, the storytellers who craft coded messages about the true nature of the people in our communities. 500 years from now, civilizations of the future will look back to understand how we spend our time on the planet, not simply out of curiosity or for entertainment, like us, they will be seeking to better understand themselves through the transformative and empowering knowledge of one's own history. They will look to the griots for answers to their questions, the artists, the musicians, the writers, the historians, the philosophers, and the poets. This is why the work being done here at the Price Institute is so vital. It seeks to create a synergistic narrative about our present and past which is deeply rooted in the perspective of the cultural participant, not just the observer. This is a somehow simultaneously simple and revolutionary idea. Part of the challenge that we face as the keepers of our rich cultural legacy is that many of our art forms, like jazz, are now being taught to us by observers <laughs> in institutions which far too often don't include us. These are the types of dangerous circumstances which allow our story to be turned into history. In general, the idea of the observer or audience member is much more of a European construct. As we take a closer look at the cultural fabric which gave birth to this ingenious art form known as jazz, it becomes abundantly clear that it is a music born from an African cultural perspective of community participation and inclusion. Imagine, if you will, a confluence of people from various African countries and cultures forced to live together in a foreign land. The British who colonized the southern portion of the United States were particularly thorough in their efforts to brutally strip these enslaved Africans of their cultural heritage. 
On most plantations, the enslaved were strictly prohibited from gathering other than to be indoctrinated into the Christian faith. These inhumane conquerors surely understood that music and art were dynamic vehicles that transport culture through space and time, which is why they were strictly forbidden. In lieu of musical instruments, the voice became the most important musical weapon to fight for cultural sustainability. The enslaved were also stripped of their native languages, so their culture had to be secretly expressed by singing in the crevices between the notes of the insufficient symmetrical European scale. This space between the notes is where the blues was born and first established its monumental presence. The blues reared its beautiful head in field hollers, work songs, ring shouts, and virtually every other form of music created in the United States from rock and roll to country music. For a group of people who were nearly stripped of their cultural history and denied the right to speak the truth about their modern reality, music became one of the few ways to express one's authentic self. It became the primary platform for individual expression in the context of a community. Further evidence of the vital social significance of music can be found in the history of Congo Square in New Orleans, Louisiana. The French, who established Louisiana in 1682, were also brutal in their enslavement of Africans. However, unlike their British counterparts in states like Alabama and Mississippi, that's right, I'm calling them out, <laughs> the French didn't completely strip the Africans of their culture. In fact, enslaved and free blacks were allowed to gather in Congo Square on Sundays to sing, dance, and play African drums and other instruments. In 1819, a white observer named Benjamin Latrobe described what he witnessed one day at Congo Square. A dense crowd of dark bodies form into circular groups. Perhaps five or six hundred individuals moving in time to the pulsations of the music. Some swaying gently, others aggressively stomping their feet. A number of women in the group begin chanting. Latrobe also wrote that never had he seen anything so brutally savage. Obviously, Latrobe didn't realize he was witnessing the melting pot that would ultimately concretize the ingredients for the foundation of America's greatest cultural contributions to the world. African-American artistic expression was being brewed in that pot on that day in Congo Square. This was a collection of people secretly solidifying a bridge that would keep them connected to centuries of genius and establish a gateway for future generations. As for Latrobe, clearly his story as an observer is not our story as participants. The truth about the genius of our people resounds with astonishing clarity in the brilliance of the music itself. The music brought us together and captured our authentic stories in organized sound. You cannot suppress genius. That would be like trying to contain water in a tightly clenched fist. Increasing the pressure only causes the water to find new ways to escape. Even if you relieve the pressure, the water may temporarily take on the shape of the hand, but will eventually evaporate or be absorbed into the skin. Genius always finds a way to express itself. 
Take, for example, the tremendous artistic and cultural explosion that occurred after the great migration north of African Americans fleeing the oppressive Jim Crow system of the South. It was here, within a 25 mile radius, that the artistic sister cities of Newark, New Jersey and Harlem, New York, incubated what would later become known as the Harlem Renaissance. That's right, I said it. <laughs> Newark, New Jersey, and Harlem, New York are artistic sister cities. There was a lot of cultural cross-fertilization between the two cities, which means although left out of the branding of the movement, the city of Newark played a vital role in the development of the Harlem Renaissance. Take, for example, the revolutionary jazz piano technique called stride piano. This is a pivotal style of playing, not only because of the level of technical mastery required, but also because of the change in social perception created by the use of the piano itself. Prior to this era, jazz was primarily played on instruments associated with marching bands, like the trumpet and trombone, and jazz was generally viewed as southern and rural. The piano, on the other hand, was thought of as an instrument of the wealthy urbanite. The creation of the stride piano style created a shift in the perception of jazz from being an unsophisticated rural music to being a sophisticated urban art form. This shift in the perception of African Americans and their art also played a major role in how the new Negro was viewed in general during the Harlem Renaissance. Now, there are three primary figures considered to be the pioneers of stride piano and its cultural ripple effect. Willie the Lion Smith, raised in Newark, New Jersey. His best friend, James P. Johnson, from New Brunswick, trained in New Newark, New Jersey. And Fats Waller, from New York City. This is just one of many examples of the unheralded role that the great city of Newark played in America's most significant artistic and social movement. The Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was a movement primarily about black pride. Inspired by the writing of W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, Harvard trained philosophy professor Alan Locke helped popularize the term the New Negro. The new Negro would no longer allow his or herself to be defined by the perception of white observers. Prior to this movement, many African Americans were forced to portray themselves as dim-witted, lazy buffoons in minstrel shows. The Harlem Renaissance marked the beginning of a new form of unapologetically authentic expression which set the stage for the later civil rights and black power movements. Musicians, actors, writers, poets, they were all striving to let their brilliance shine. You cannot suppress genius. It always finds a way to express itself. During a time when society put up seemingly insurmountable barriers to becoming an astronaut or the president of the United States, our collective genius found a way. It found a space to express itself in the brilliant music of Duke Ellington and in the writing of Langston Hughes. In the 1980s, when many public school music and art programs are being cut from poor communities, our collective genius found a way by creating rap music and graffiti. Jazz is the sonic manifestation of black genius fighting to find a way. It is the sound of the hopes and dreams 
of a marginalized people clinging to the unrealized promises of American, American democracy. democracy. Thank <laughs> you.